Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're giving our recommendations for the best gaming monitors you can buy right now, updated for the holiday season of 2021. Throughout the year we've provided a number of these updates, including dedicated videos covering 1080p, 1440p and 4K monitors. But in this video we're going to go through everything to make it a comprehensive guide to gaming monitor shopping. This year, as part of updating our monitor testing methodology, I've personally tested nearly 60 displays, of which just over half were new in 2021. As with our previous best of videos, we tend to talk about and recommend monitors we've personally tested and know to be good, or monitors that are very similar to products that we have tested. It's always worth going back and checking out the dedicated monitor reviews we produce for more in-depth thoughts on each product, but just so you know, these recommendations are not sponsored in any way by any company, they're based on our testing results and research. In this video, we'll be going through five main categories, covering 1080p, 1440p, 4K, ultra-wide, and HDR gaming monitors, with several recommendations in each category. As such, I'll be keeping my thoughts on each product pretty brief, talking a little bit about the pros and cons on offer. And any pricing that we talk about was correct at the time of filming, but of course, you should check in your region given the focus here is on monitors in USD, and I know that a lot of people view from outside the States. Let's kick things off with the most popular resolution to buy this year, 1440p. If you're after a 1440p gaming monitor, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what sort of 1440p monitor do you want? Because there are a ton of products on the market today, covering many refresh rates, sizes, panel types, and price points. This can make buying a 1440p monitor pretty daunting, but also there are so many options that there should be something for everyone, including budget shoppers. When you're just starting out with a 1440p monitor, my recommendation would be to grab something 27 inches in size, using an IPS panel, with a medium refresh rate in the 144 to 180 hertz zone. These products are currently the best bang for buck in the entire monitor market and continue to drop in price every time I do one of these videos. So if you're after a great budget monitor or a great value buy, here's what I'd choose. My go-to choice at the moment is the Gigabyte M27Q, which is currently available at an insane price of below $300 US. It's very difficult to go past the M27Q at this price point. It offers decent mid-range response time performance, a generous 170Hz refresh rate, a wide color gamut with an sRGB mode, great ergonomics thanks to a height adjustable stand, fantastic viewing angles and a solid contrast ratio for an IPS, plus neat features like a KVM switch. It delivers a really astonishing mix of gaming performance and color quality at this price point, plus it's come down in price by $80 since I first reviewed it a year ago. The M27Q outperforms many other entry-level 1440p monitors with more of a mid-range experience, which is why it's easy to recommend. The main downside is the use of an IPS panel with a BGR subpixel layout instead of the conventional RGB layout. This has a small effect on text clarity in some use cases, although I've personally found it to only be a minor issue in Windows applications after a run through with the clear type utility. I'd recommend it regardless of this issue, or alternatively the Gigabyte G27Q might be worth considering at a similar price. I'd also look at the MSI Optics G273QF as an alternate option, though we haven't tested it and it's more expensive. While not as good value as the M27Q, if you want a better performing product, then there are a couple of options that use an LG Nano IPS panel instead, available for around $330 to $350. The LG 27GP83B would be my first choice, or alternatively the Dell S2721DGF, which is a tad cheaper. Both of these monitors are, on average, a bit faster than the M27Q in terms of response times and pack a wider color gamut with 98% DCI-P3 coverage versus 92%. They also use a regular RGB subpixel layout, so text clarity is pristine, and overall they are very impressive. I'd choose the 27GP83B over the S2721DGF as it features a great sRGB mode, whereas the Dell model can be oversaturated at times. The downside to going with an LG-based monitor is the contrast ratio, which is fairly weak, just 811 to 1 in the case of the 27GP83B. That's the sacrifice you make for lightning-fast response times in this class, so it's a toss-up between speed or image quality. I think they are worth considering though, as they do generally outperform the M27Q and pricing is reasonably fair, so something to think about if you have a bit more cash to spend. 
If you have more like $400 to spend, then the outright best option is the MSI MAG274 QRF-QD, which so far is the best performing option I've tested in the 1440p medium refresh rate class. It's an IPS monitor with a 165Hz refresh rate, it's fast, similar to LG's Nano IPS panel, so it delivers great motion clarity while gaming, and it doesn't have the same contrast ratio downside, delivering over a 1000 to 1 result, which is more like you'd want and expect from IPS technology, and 28% higher than some of LG's variants. It's also got an extremely wide color gamut, covering all of sRGB, DCI-P3, and Adobe RGB, giving it excellent versatility for both gaming and content creation. And MSI recently added an sRGB mode via a firmware update, it's often only slightly more expensive than the 27GP83B and would be my go-to choice if you have a mid-range 1440p budget. If you want the best of the best at a 1440p resolution, then you should be aiming for a 240Hz option as a number have been released in the last 18 months and they should all offer great longevity and future-proofing, think 5 years or more of usage. However, they are a lot more expensive than medium refresh rate options, starting at around $650 with monitors priced between $650 and the $400 we've just been looking at generally not worth considering. When choosing something 1440p, I'd generally recommend the Samsung Odyssey G7 in its 27-inch variant for $700 US. It has the fastest response times we've ever tested on a 1440p monitor, which combined with its 240Hz refresh rate and variable overdrive leads to excellent motion clarity, not just at 240Hz but across the entire refresh range. Then, because it's a VA panel, it also has great black levels and a high contrast ratio, making it well suited for gaming in dark environments. Color quality is generally impressive as a result, including a decent wide gamut. The main downside to the Odyssey G7 is its aggressive 1000R curve, which is a divisive feature. You either love it or hate it, and I guess I'm more in the hate it camp. The curve limits its versatility. The Odyssey G7 is really only well suited for gaming. Content creation and productivity suffers from curve-related distortion. The wide color gamut isn't as wide as other options, and uniformity can be mixed. Samsung also has a less than stellar record of quality control issues, which we've covered in a video previously. If those downsides sound annoying to you, choosing an IPS panel instead might be the way to go. It will be more versatile and generally perform very well. Previously, I'd been recommending the ASUS ROG Strix PG279QM here, which is a truly excellent monitor with class-leading IPS performance and outstanding factory calibration. However, at $900, I feel it's a bit expensive when a similar alternative, the Acer XB273UGX, exists at just $650. I haven't tested this Acer monitor personally yet, but it appears to use the same panel as the ASUS model, and performance by all reports is still excellent, so that's one to consider for sure. As a final note in the 1440p section, the majority of the displays we've been talking about are all 27 inches in size, which I feel is a great size for this resolution. However, if you want something larger, say in the 32 inch category, look no further than the Gigabyte M32Q, the larger variant of the M27Q. If anything, the M32Q is actually better than the M27Q in most areas. It's faster in terms of response times, it doesn't use a BGR subpixel layout, and it retains many of the 1440p 170Hz IPS qualities, just in a larger size. It's also highly affordable at just $360, US almost half the price of the ASUS ROG Swift PG329Q, which is a great display in its own right, but is only marginally better and certainly not worth the added cost. Higher-end buyers should consider the larger version of the Samsung Odyssey G7 here at $800 US. The 1080p monitor market is a segment that hasn't changed too much since we provided a dedicated video on the topic back in April. There haven't been a lot of standout 1080p releases in 2021, however the good news is that as we approach the holiday season, prices for 1080p monitors have crept back down to where they should be after being rather inflated during the pandemic. Some of our favorite options that were previously out of stock are now available once again and at great prices. The primary reason to buy a 1080p monitor in 2021 is you want something affordable, specifically for below $250, which is a market that 1440p isn't servicing very well yet. 1080p monitors are the cheapest you can get at a medium 144Hz refresh rate and are far cheaper than 1440p options at 240Hz as well. 
The most compelling 1080p monitor right now to me is the ASUS Tough Gaming VG259QM, which is available on sale at some retailers for an unbelievably good price of just $230. The VG259QM is a 24.5 inch 1080p flat IPS monitor with a 280Hz refresh rate, and this is one of the cheapest 240Hz plus IPS monitors I've ever seen. This is a great entry point for high refresh rate gaming and is an awesome buy for esports gaming and competitive shooters in general. I've reviewed the larger variant of this monitor, the VG279QM, and found it to be excellent with solid response times typical of current generation IPS panels, great factory calibration with a no-fuss sRGB color gamut, and low input latency. The use of an IPS panel delivers far better color quality, viewing angles, and contrast to that of a TN alternative, so even though it's not quite as fast as the best TN monitors, it's a better choice for everyday usage that might include stuff other than gaming. The 24.5 inch size of the VG259QM is also ideal for a 1080p resolution, and the build quality, including a height adjustable stand, is very solid. If you want the absolute best of the best at a 1080p high refresh rate though, you should consider the BenQ XL2546K, which is specifically designed for esports gaming. It's expensive at $500 US, and that in itself will make it a niche buy, but the XL2546K has class-leading backlight strobing technology, which when combined with its elite TN response times, delivers unbeatable motion clarity. Literally, you will not be beating this with a different 1080p monitor, at least from what I've seen. If speed and clarity is the number one priority for you, and you have a large budget, look no further than this BenQ monitor. As for a more value-oriented 1080p option, I'm happy to see that once again the AOC 24G2 is in the leading position after a period of being more expensive than I'd like it to be. For just $170, the 24G2 delivers a really excellent experience, bringing a 24-inch 1080p 144Hz IPS panel that performs well and packs solid color quality, regardless if you get the original 2019 variant or the updated 2020 variant. It also includes an ergonomic stand with height adjustment, often omitted from other budget 1080p monitors. The overall package AOC are offering is nicely balanced between gaming performance and image quality, so I'm comfortable continuing to recommend it. Other options I considered were products like the MSI G24 II and Gigabyte G24F, but both are often more expensive and don't appear to be offering anything better than what the AOC monitor provides. I've also really liked the performance BenQ delivers with the EX2510. It's a better all-round package than the AOC 24G2, but it's very hard to justify at $250 when the ASUS VG259QM can be found at just $230. From here the question becomes, is there anything worth buying if I have less than $170 to spend? Unfortunately, the answer is mostly no. You can shave off around $10 opting for a curved VA panel instead, with 1080p 144Hz specifications. However, I've typically found these monitors perform much worse than the 24G2 with unsightly issues like dark level smearing, making them not worth the $10 price saving. Then for around $150, you can usually find TN monitors, which again, while they are cheaper, perform well below that of the 24G2 for only a small cash saving. So I personally would save up my money until I could afford the 24G2. The category that's seen the biggest suite of improvements this year is the 4K high refresh category. None of the monitors I was recommending in my previous update earlier this year would I recommend right now, as we've seen, a ton of new, better performing, and more affordable options hit the market in the last six months. I've also just covered the best 4K monitors in a video a month ago, and everything in that video is still relevant today, so I'll keep this one brief as that video will give you more information if you need it. Right now, I'd split up the 4K choices into two sizes, 27 inches and 32 inches, with the expectation of getting at least a 144Hz refresh rate to make them future-proof and great for gaming. In the 27-inch category, I'd look no further than Gigabyte's M28U, which offers excellent performance at a relatively cheap price point of just $650, US much lower than previous year's best choices, which were more like $800 or even higher. The M28U has very good response time performance, with an average transition in our testing of 4 milliseconds at 144Hz. It also has very good performance across the refresh range, so for those using Adaptive Sync variable refresh rates, you don't need to tweak overdrive settings to get the best experience. What Gigabyte offers for color quality is also very strong thanks to it being an IPS panel, so viewing angles are excellent and it does pack a wide color gamut, though not as wide as the best monitors of today. 
Factory calibration is above average, there's a very good sRGB mode for everyday use, and contrast is typical for an IPS panel, no major issues there. To top it all off, Gigabyte include a KVM switch and a height adjustable stand, which are both neat feature additions. All up, this is a highly versatile monitor that's great for gaming and productivity work, which you might want considering its high resolution. There aren't many weaknesses, yeah it doesn't have the best colour gamut coverage for P3 or Adobe RGB, and its HDMI 2.1 ports aren't full bandwidth. But most of the complaints are nitpicks, which is why it ends up being the best bang for buck option, and often is out of stock so it might be a bit hard to find. An alternate option might be the Samsung Odyssey G7 S28 model, which is on sale at a similar price and uses the same panel, but we're yet to test it so it doesn't get a recommendation from us just yet. The main reason why I recommend the M28U over other options is that most other options are simply a lot more expensive. The LG 27GN950 and its newer variant, the 27GP950, used to be my go-to choices, but I just can't justify the $800 or even $900 price tag for what ends up being only slightly better performance. The same goes for the EVE Spectrum 4K we just reviewed, and the ASUS Tough Gaming VG28 UQL1A. At 32 inches, I feel the quality of monitor offerings isn't as good as at 27 inches, however the additional size is something that a lot of people may want considering 4K still looks excellent at 32 inches. For most people, I'd recommend the Gigabyte M32Q, which is the cheaper and essentially identical performing version of the Gigabyte Aorus FI32U we looked at. This monitor has decent response time performance and decent colour quality, it's not a leader in any one area, but I think it will suffice for most buyers as a solid all-rounder. It's also not too expensive at $800, which is cheaper than most other 32-inch 4K IPS 144Hz monitors. If you want to step up in terms of performance and features, then the MSI Optics MPG321 UR-QD is what I'd go with. Occasionally I've seen it for as low as $750, down from its usual price of $900, which is a great deal if you can get it, and a clear winner over the M32Q. But even at its normal price, I think it's worth considering. It's not as fast as the M32Q and response times aren't its strength, but it makes up for this with excellent colour performance including a very wide colour gamut, multiple well calibrated modes for sRGB P3 and Adobe RGB, full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 and backlight strobing with adaptive sync support simultaneously. The MSI model is a great choice if you want something decent for productivity and creative work that can still function well as a gaming monitor through its 144Hz refresh rate, while the M32Q is more of a gaming first option. The ultra-wide category was probably the hardest to make firm recommendations in because I haven't spent a lot of time reviewing ultra-wides this year. However, there also haven't been too many major releases and only a couple of panels dominate the choices. If you want an entry-level ultra-wide with a 3440x1440 resolution, the minimum I would recommend when going 21.9, then VA panels are still your best bet. However, I wouldn't recommend spending more than $450 on this sort of monitor, as there is still a number of issues with the lower end panels being used here. The primary concern is dark level smearing, which causes blur trails and ghosting in dark content on these basic VA panels, a major issue and why we don't normally recommend VA panels in other categories for gaming. The majority of today's VA ultrawides use some variant of Samsung's SVA panel, occasionally you get Aoptronics, but all have issues in this area. Outside of this though, you do typically get a great contrast ratio in the 2500 to 1 range or greater, which delivers excellent black levels among LCD monitors. A typical curve of 1500R or 1800R is well suited to ultra-wide gaming and colour performance is decent. My pick of these monitors is the Gigabyte G34WQC or AOC CU34G2X, which are both priced around $450 and offer a very similar experience, so check pricing in your region, and ideally I'd buy them if they were more around the $400 mark. Based on my testing, the Gigabyte model is a tad bit faster and had a higher contrast ratio, so that's probably what I'd go with. Some regions should also consider the Xiaomi Mi Curved 34-inch monitor, which is surprisingly good. However, while these VA monitors aren't too bad, they also don't present a huge discount compared to today's budget 3440x1440 IPS ultrawide monitors, such as the Gigabyte M34WQ or Acer XV340CK, which are priced in the $450 to $500 range. These are flat IPS panels which perform better, and don't have dark level smearing due to their inherent use of IPS technology. Unfortunately though, I haven't tested them yet to know where they sit, so this section comes with that caveat. It's something to consider if you do your research and read other reviews though. 
With these products in mind, I find it hard to recommend higher end ultra wide IPS monitors like the LG 34 GN850. The GN850 is a great product that performs very well, significantly better than the VA ultra wides I've tested, but a price tag of $900 feels very high these days when that sort of money gets you a 32 inch 4K 144Hz gaming monitor or a high end 1440p 240Hz display. I'd probably stay away from that sort of monitor at the moment unless you see a big discount. Then at the high end of the market, you're typically looking at less mainstream ultra-wide formats. One option, for example, the 3840x1600 monitors like the LG 38GN95B or MSI MEG 381CQR+. Performance from these panels is generally great and in line with the best IPS monitors of today, but also this larger ultra-wide format is quite expensive with products starting at $1500. It's another category I'd be hesitant to recommend due to the price. Then we also have the Samsung family of super ultra-wides like the Odyssey G9 and Odyssey Neo G9. The regular G9 is currently on sale at an attractive $1100 price point, which is definitely worth considering if you want a 5120 x 1440 240Hz VA panel with top tier performance including class leading response times and the deep blacks on offer with VA technology. It's basically a wider version of the Odyssey G7 we recommended in the 1440p section, and I would choose this over products such as the 34G and 850 and the 38-inch monitors from a moment ago if you do have the space for it. Then we have the Odyssey Neo G9. Due to Samsung's quality control issues we detailed in a dedicated video on the topic, including scanline issues and HDR performance bugs, I normally wouldn't recommend it in this sort of video. But there's also really nothing like it, so it's impossible to recommend an alternative. I'm therefore including it here tentatively, but you should be well aware of the potential issues before dropping $2,500 of your hard-earned cash. What the Neo G9 does well is adding true HDR to the already great package of the regular G9. With a 2048 zone mini LED backlight, it elevates the gaming experience to the next level when it works properly, which to be fair has improved with recent firmware updates. It's not exactly a cheap or great bang for buck addition though, increasing the price by over $1000, so you'd have to be a wealthy gamer to consider it, especially with the risk of quality control issues. The HDR section of this video is very straightforward because there aren't a lot of true HDR gaming monitors on the market today. The vast majority of displays you see that advertise HDR capabilities don't have any meaningful HDR hardware and therefore are fake HDR monitors, so it's important to do your research. If the monitor doesn't tell you the amount of local dimming zones, or if the number of zones isn't in the hundreds, don't even bother buying it for its HDR capabilities because the HDR experience will be poor at best, or more likely absolutely atrocious. However, there are a couple of true HDR displays on the market. One of them is the Samsung Odyssey Neo G9 we talked about just before, so all the same pros and cons apply. With the firmware fix applied, the Neo G9 is capable of great HDR through its 2048 zone full array local dimming backlight and respectable level of brightness. It's also a strong performer overall with its super wide screen, 240Hz refresh rate and 1440p class resolution. The same downsides over Samsung's quality control also apply here, so buy it with caution. If you don't want an ultra-wide, unfortunately the best 16:9 aspect ratio HDR gaming monitor is very very expensive in the ASUS ROG Swift PG32 UQX. It's also, all things considered, not that amazing due to its slow response time performance by modern standards, something I really would have expected to be improved given its monstrous $2,900 price tag. It also lacks HDMI 2.1, limiting its compatibility with modern 4K HDR capable gaming consoles like the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. However, the HDR experience is undoubtedly strong thanks to its peak brightness that exceeds 1600 nits, 1152 zone full array local dimming backlight, and very wide color gamut. It's also a decent size at 32 inches, it uses IPS technology, and features a 144Hz refresh rate. I'd only buy this if you are rich and have money to burn. Outside of that, you're honestly better off buying an LG C1 OLED in a 48 inch panel size if you want the best HDR gaming experience on PC today. Until we get smaller OLED panels, or more affordable true HDR gaming monitors, buying a TV like the LG C1 is the best way to go and is also by far the cheapest option. Currently the LG C1 is available for just $1100, down from its usual $1500 asking price, which puts it at nearly a third of the price of the PG32UQX for what is largely a superior HDR experience. 
The C1 being an OLED panel has self-lit pixels, meaning it can deliver impressive black levels and an effectively infinite contrast ratio with no blooming or haloing issues that you might get with LCD-based local dimming. This leads to astonishing HDR performance with a level of contrast that LCD monitors simply cannot achieve right now. The C1 is also strong in terms of gaming features, with low input lag for a TV, a 120Hz refresh rate, plenty of HDMI 2.1 ports, and all sorts of other potentially useful processing and TV related features. The price tag is also very tempting right now. However, as we described in our review of the C1, which is well worth watching as it goes into all of this stuff in more detail, there are lots of drawbacks to actually using this as a monitor. It's a massive display that requires a larger than normal viewing distance. The risk of permanent burn-in and low brightness levels makes it poorly suited to productivity in everyday desktop app usage. You should really only use the C1 for content consumption. It also only has HDMI 2.1 ports, so 4K 120Hz is limited to the newest graphics cards. If you're absolutely desperate for an HDR gaming display, I'd probably choose the LG C1 despite all its drawbacks, but for most people, I would genuinely consider buying something else and waiting for the HDR gaming monitor ecosystem to mature. There are too few choices and too many early adopter drawbacks here for my liking at the moment, especially considering the prices of some of these displays. And that does it for today's monitor recommendation video. Lots and lots of options to choose from covering most of the categories I hope you are considering at the moment. If you do want to learn more about the monitors we've talked about today, we do have dedicated reviews for most of them that will go into the specifics around performance and features, which are well worth watching. I also have longer breakdowns available for the best 1080p, 1440p, and 4K monitors on the channel, though just be aware that some of those recommendations may be a bit less relevant in today's market. Uh, some of those videos are a couple of months old now. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel and all our monitor testing that we do throughout the year. We do have links below to check pricing for some of these monitors and of course to sign up to our Patreon and Floatplane accounts if you want to support the monitor testing that we do throughout the year. But if you don't want to do that, that's understandable as well. And we just have our monitor review playlist linked below as well so you can check out all the reviews of stuff that we provide for you guys. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.